so now we're going to talk a little bit about the post-operative care of the trabeculectomy patient. And so we're going to go over the basic post-op care, the types and causes of trabeculectomy failure, uh, how failing trabeculectomies present and what you can do about it, and the kinds of clinical interventions you can do, and also the recognition and management of various complications. The most important take-home points is, are, include the fact that, as I said earlier, a trabeculectomy is not a 45-minute procedure. It's a three- to four-month procedure in terms of being, the post-operative care is key to the success of the procedure. And the hard work really begins when the patient uh, leaves the operating room. Um, and the patients and the doctors really need to understand that to have the procedure work and be successful, uh, it really requires a partnership between the patient and the doctor to manage uh, wound healing, manage potential complications to get the best uh, um, outcome. The goals of filtration surgery are getting a functional bleb, a comfortable bleb, as well as preservation of visual function. The ideal bleb is one that is diffuse, not isolated like a, like a bubble on the surface of the eye. It should be low and not distended. It should um, never be injected, at least uh, in, after the first week or so. And it should have an intact epithelium. It should definitely not be this chalky white uh, bleb uh, that has little epithelium on top of it. Those are a setup for infection and other complications. And it should be comfortable for the patient and control the intraocular pressure. There are many places that um, the a bleb can fail. Starting from the inside of the eye, there can be an internal membrane or iris that goes into the uh, opening that we create. There can be too tight of a scleral flap. There can be an episcleral membrane, fibrosis at, a numerous, at numerous levels, as well as a tenon cyst or a bleb leak, which is what we worry about. Because if flow goes out through a leak, the conjunctiva tacks down and eventually fails. So why do TRABs um, fail early? Uh, they can fail early because of occlusion by iris or even vitreous. Uh, they can cause, uh, be caused by scarring or fibrosis of the flap or scarring of the conjunctiva to the sclera. And why do they fail late? They can fail also because of leaks, uh, external fibrosis as well as leaks and infection. Risk factors for having a trabeculectomy that fails includes a history of a prior trabeculectomy that has failed, uh, prior conjunctival surgery. So if you've done an extra cap surgery or you've taken down the con conjunctiva for manual small incision cataract surgery, you've already prompted the wound healing response, the scarring response. You've turned it on. So that's an eye that has a likelihood of scarring um, even if you do everything right, because the eye is primed to try to heal quickly. Um, younger patients are at higher risk of, redu of failure, as well as failing to use some form of wound healing modification, such as mitomycin or 5-fluorouracil. Late, but the, the antifibrotic agents are a double-edged sword, and late failures sometimes happen because you use too much of the antimetabolite and it causes a thin bleb that allows infections or leaks to develop sometimes years later. And this is what I'm talking about. This is a patient in whom I did a trabeculectomy in his 20s, and he showed up about 10 years later with a bleb that had purulence in it, and he had a hypopion, and this is a bad situation, obviously. Um, and he had not been seen in our office for about five years, and he came in for an uncomfortable eye. And un unfortunately, this, didn't, this eye did not do, do well because he presented with this. Um, a question that people often ask is, why not just stick a tube in the eye? And 
the problem is, and they've been trying tubes like that for 200 plus years to stick pieces of horse hair and other things into the eye to allow fluid to come out. But the problem is that uh, scarring happens. There are new techniques that you may have read about, such as the Preserflow and the Zen implant, which are tubes, but they will not work unless you apply very aggressive mitomycin uh, to make them work. So a tube that ends in the subconjunctival space with no wound management is just going to fail very quickly. Um, the intraoperative techniques uh, for closing conjunctiva, this is not the technique that I use, but I do have a QR code if you want to take a picture of it. You can go to YouTube and learn about how um, Gary Condon closes the conjunctiva. He has some very nice um, videos you can find on how to close the conjunctiva in this situation. So common to all uh, glaucoma surgery, it's important to um, preoperatively counsel the patient on what is to be expected, that it's not like their friend who had cataract surgery and was seeing well a week later and was out, um, you know, doing sports or, or whatever a few days later. This is real surgery that takes several weeks to sometimes months to get the vision back to where they were at baseline. You need to reduce inflammation uh, both prior to surgery as well as after surgery. And we want to prevent things like cystoid macular edema. We want to manage the bleb and adjust the management based on the appearance of the bleb as well as the intraocular pressure. My typical postoperative regimen is to use steroid four to six times a day or um, diflupredinate. Uh, four times a day. We also use an antibiotic for about a week. That is uh, coming under criticism or that there's really no good evidence um, that uh, postoperative medication antibiotics prevent infections. And in fact, it may actually select for resistant organisms. There's very good evidence that giving patients a preoperative course of an antibiotic prior to surgery is only going to select for resistant organisms that already exist in their um, conjunctiva. I will sometimes uh, cycloplege a patient with, uh, who is phacic, but I base that on whether their chamber is formed or not on the first postoperative day. I usually see the patients on day one, then about a week later, and then every other week or so for the first month or two, depending on how the patient is doing and then once or twice, sometimes in the third month. At that point, you have a sense of the patient's trajectory and how they're going to be doing, and you can adjust um, the frequency of the visits thereafter. The goals at each of the postoperative visits is to evaluate and med manage um, the bleb. Uh, we want to carefully increase the amount of flow through the bleb, through the filtration site, to maintain the bleb. We don't want to overshoot early on and have too low a pressure because that can give you problems. Um, and we want to use releasable sutures or laser suture lysis to encourage flow uh, when it is appropriate. I rarely cut a stitch on the first day because I really want the conjunctiva to seal down. Um, but if you have to, you sometimes will. Well, often... Um, and we also want to monitor the fibrosis of the, of the bleb and, um, and intervene as necessary. If we're concerned that the bleb is failing, um, you need to identify the location of the failure as well as um, uh, what you can do about it. And the number one cause of trabeculectomies failing is scarring of the conjunctiva uh, to the episclera. And the risk factors, you guys can read this as well as I can speak, um, but the risk factors for the early postoperative period is a low bleb, a leaking bleb, or low aqueous production allows the conjunctiva to start settling down back onto the sclera and then scar in place. So you really need to be encouraging flow through the system during those first few weeks 
to establish flow that lifts the conjunctiva up off the sclera so it doesn't scar in place. We are, some of us in glaucoma joke that we are nothing more than blebologists. We study blebs, we manage blebs, uh, and we worry about the blebs in our patients. Um, but basic blebology is that we want to look at the height of the bleb, the extent of it, how vascularized it is, whether there are microcysts in the conjunctiva, and we'll often use a Seidel test to look and see whether there's a leak that we're missing. Sometimes a leak can be very subtle. So let's go through some case examples. And again, I forgot to mention it was on the title slide. This is a, a lecture put together by my friend Cindy Maddox, who is the former president of the American Glaucoma Society. She retired, but she shared uh, this lecture with me, which I've augmented with some cases of my own. So this is one day after a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. The pressure is six millimeters of mercury. The patient has trace cell in the anterior chamber. And what do you think the bleb is going to look like? Any thoughts? So how do you want to evaluate um, this bleb? You want to... Um, See, there's very little amount of bleb, and you want to be able to look at seeing whether or not there is a leak. So the patient had a flat, had a low pressure, but a flat bleb. So you really want um, to monitor for this. And this is not uncommon in the fornix-based closures that you saw me do today. And I think she provides a video at the slit lamp. I think everyone here knows how to do a Seidel test. Um, but they can sometimes be subtle or they can be, you know, quite brisk as you see here. Um, but that's something that you need to fix pretty quickly um, after the surgery. Now, we'll sometimes use a wide diameter contact lens, something called a contour contact lens. I don't know if you have it here. Um, some people will patch the eye for a day or two. Um, but, um, and we, if you we have a contact lens that a soft lens that rides over the limbus and covers the area of the trabeculectomy leak, you want to leave that in place for at least a week and not touch it, because every time you manipulate it, uh, you're going to cause problems. I deal with this maybe once every two or three months, I think is, is about right, Dr. S Dr. Vahedi, and it usually fixes the problem. Sometimes you need to cycle through a um, but sometimes you do need to go back to the operating room. And if you have to suture it, you need to do that for brisk leaks or if the sutures at the limbus uh, released or melted and the conjunctiva retracted, you really need to go back to the operating room to tighten it or, you're, or to re-suture or you're going to lose the trabeculectomy. There are ways of closing this at the slit lamp and um, Dr. Uh, Maddox suggests using a very small suture and cut the um, suture only about an inch or two long because you don't want to have the, the sutures all over the place uh, as you're doing this. So let's do case number two. This is one day after a trabeculectomy. The pressure is 38 millimeters of mercury. There's a deep anterior chamber and a and mild cell. And what do you expect the bleb to look like? Dr. Chisi, any thoughts? A flat bleb, okay. And exactly right. You have a, a flat bleb. And you can, uh, what would you do to evaluate uh, this one? If it was, this is a different one. What do you think is going on here? Speak up, I can't hear over the. Uh, I don't know, I'm thinking the PP is picked, so could be an occlusion on the blip. Absolutely, it's exactly right. The clue here of what's going on in this trabeculectomy is that the um, iris is going up through the, into the trabeculectomy site. This is why we do iridectomies. 
but sometimes the patient will aggressively rub the eye or do something else that pushes iris up into the, um, into the sclerostomy. So internal uh, obstruction of the sclerostomy, you want to recognize a low bleb with a high pressure, no, di- no response to doing massage. Sometimes massage can make it be worse. So sometimes you want to look, and I wouldn't massage the eye that had that peak pupil because that's almost certainly occlusion, and I don't want to make it worse. Um, so the diagnosis is made with gonioscopy, and here you can see that the iris, uh, nobody did a PI, or there's just somebody pushed on it, and the iris went up into the um, uh, internal ostium. You can treat it with a laser to constrict the pupil. Sometimes that'll pull it out. You can use pilocarpine. Um, If there's blood and fibrin, uh, you can use TPA. These are all different things that you can do for internal blockage of the trabeculectomy site. So two weeks after a trabeculectomy, the patient comes in with a pressure of 24 millimeters of mercury, a deep anterior chamber, um, rare cell, a round pupil, and no leak. So what would you expect this bleb to look like? So what do you think is going on here? So it probably represents um, a tight scleral flap. Um, And so what you're going to see there is um, Dr. Maddox, I think, either does a laser uh, in this, this, but you can often tell that you can push on the bleb and cause the, the fluid to flow through, and that gives you an idea that you need to loosen one of the sutures. As I said during the first procedure, I will usually, I don't like to laser the suture early on, but once uh, the patient has had a little bit of healing, I'm quite aggressive about suturing the, uh, lasering the sutures. Um, so to recognize the, the, the tight scleral flap, you expect to see a low bleb with a high intraocular pressure. Um, you don't get much response to the digital pressure and will often operate, watch them. But then we do the laser um, to try to uh, cut the suture if necessary. And here is the laser. Um, You're able to see the suture, and then she lasered it, and now you can see the two ends of the suture. And this is what the bleb looks like after releasing that suture. So now you see this diffuse bleb, uh, and the patient is heading towards a nicer result. So two weeks after trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, uh, the pressure is 12 with the deep anterior chamber. It's a round pupil. There's no leak. And what if the bleb looks like this? What do you think is happening here? You're happy. The pressure is great. Nice bleb. But is that bleb nice? What don't you like about it? The congestion of the blood vessels. And something that's very typical for early fibrosis, as fibroblasts are being um, recruited to start um, scarring, is that you get these sort of ropey, sort of curly Q vessels. And when you see that, you you can't be complacent about that. You need to treat it with an injection of 5-fluorouracil or something like that to suppress um, the scarring. So what is happening is conjunctival injection and these ropey-looking vessels, and you've already evaluated why there's... um, uh, low bleb, so we will increase the steroids. We'll usually do 5-FU injections um, and increase flow into the bleb, so we may cut a stitch to just allow more flow while, um, while we're trying to suppress the fibrosis. And this can be managed very, very nicely. Um, I use tetracaine several times, um, and we use a 30-gauge needle, and Usually about, I use the full strength that comes out of the vial. The vial is usually uh, five milligrams per 
ml, I forget. No, it's 50 to 500. I, I forget what it comes out, but 0 0.1 of the full, 0 0.1 ml of the full strength uh, solution that you get out of a, of a vial is uh, five milligrams, and that's what you generally use. So seven weeks after a trabeculectomy, you've lysed all of the scleral flap sutures. The pressure is 25. And what do you expect the uh, bleb to look like? What's going on here? This is what's called a tenons capsule cyst. And this is a situation in which the body has created a membrane over it that is now inflated. It's sort of compressed tenons tissue. And this will usually go away on its own, but it's important to be proactive about it. Um, and we'll use a little bit of aqueous suppressants, digital massage, and I'll often needle uh, the bleb with uh, 5-FU usually, or you can rarely, rarely excise uh, with mitomycin. But what you can see here, which is nicely shown, is the slit lamp, you can see the conjunctiva, and then under it, there's like a separate cyst. And that gives you an idea of the mechanism of what's going on. This is something uh, called an episcleral cap where there's fibrosis just over it. Um, and you, even if you laser the, the sutures, you really don't see much of an effect. We'll often do massage for a little while to see whether or not that just opens things up. But sometimes, We'll do a needling with 5-FU and go in and actually break things up. This is something that you can do with a slit lamp. I prefer to do it in a minor room with the patient lying down so they don't suddenly jerk around. You approach um, temporally. I usually use a 30 or a 27 gauge needle and go in from the side, inject some of the 5-FU to raise things to avoid hitting blood vessels. And then I sweep with the needle to open up the um, episcleral cap, essentially, that's over the trabeculectomy. Um, we use a lot of 5-FU, but you need to watch for conjunctival toxicity in these patients. The patients are miserable. Uh, this is way before any of your time, uh, but in the 1980s, when I was a resident, we did the 5-FU uh, study, the 5 fluorouracil surgery study, the FFSS, which was a study sponsored by the National Eye Institute. And the protocol was twice daily 5-FU injections for the first week and then once daily 5-FU injections for the second week. As the resident, I got to give the injections, and by the third day, the patients hated me. <laughs> But these patients often ended up with um, a lot of corneal toxicity, and we now realize that that was much too aggressive um, an approach. Um, you can do mitomycin C, um, and what we'll often do there is we'll inject a little bit in the subconjunctival space, move it around under the conjunctiva, wait for the mitomycin to bind to all the tissue, and then go in with the needle to open it. You don't want to inject and then immediately lyse the fibrosis because the mitomycin can gain, gain access to the anterior chamber, which is not a good thing. So here she shows a bleb needling revision. She loves doing this at the slit lamp. I prefer to do it uh, in the minor room, and she's taking an MVR blade after she's injected mitomycin. And I tend to do this, as I said, with a 30 or a 27 gauge needle. And she's going into, even into the flap or moving side to side. She got a little blood there. But you can see flow starting. And she's opening up the trabeculectomy side. I did one of these a couple of weeks ago. 
and it was just dramatic. But as soon as you get through that, she get the patient gets a nice diffuse blood. All right, and this is what it looked like before, and this is what it looks like immediately afterwards, and you can see the patient has a nice diffuse bleb. So that was a bleb that was destined, doomed to fail, uh, but if you are aggressive and, and intervene when this is happening, you can get a trabeculectomy to work. The serious um, uh, complications that we worry about are suprachoroidal hemorrhage, a flat anterior chamber with uh, lens cornea touch, I'm less concerned about iris touch because the endothelium is not going to is going to have oxygenation from the iris, and is not going to uh, going to fail. But if the lens is flat, you're going to lose endothelium in the very center. You can always worry about hypotony maculopathy, wipeout syndrome, as well as endophthalmitis, which nobody likes. Less serious com complications can include choroidal effusions, anterior chamber shallowing, um, hyphemas that are not uncommon on early on after the surgery, and CME and vitreous hemorrhage. Overfiltration can result in choroidal, choroidal effusions, as you can see in the lower right, possibly a choroidal hemorrhage, not sure. And you can have hypotony, and this is classic stria on the cornea that's indicative that the uh, pressure is just too low to keep the um, cornea smooth and uh, serving as a good optical uh, site. So you're sitting there with a pressure of six or seven and the patient's complaining that their vision is terrible and you put a little fluorescein and you see this and now you understand why the patient's vision is poor is because the cornea is not a good optical surface. So the treatment of hypotony, if it's not terrible, is to just wait and maybe back off on a little bit of the steroid in the hopes that a little bit of uh, fibrosis will occur. Um, you want to increase um, aqueous production. So you want to, um, if they're on diamox for the uh, acetazolamide for the other eye, you may want to stop that. If they're on medications in the other eye, such as timolol and dorzolamide and bromonidine, that's fine, but make sure that they're using punctal occlusion so that they're not getting a systemic effect that's supp suppressing aqueous in the surgery arm. Um, again, uh, overfiltration. You want to treat maculopathy if you start seeing it pretty early. Otherwise, the structural changes in the macula will slowly become permanent. If you have to, you can reverse, revise the trabeculectomy. Something else you can do, and this is Dr. Maddox's video of uh, injecting viscoelastic to deepen the anterior chamber. And sometimes just raising the pressure a little bit with viscoelastic is enough to cause the choroidals to start um, reabsorbing and uh, the ciliary body to start making aqueous. If you have to drain choroidals and go and drain them, um, you really need to correct whatever the problem was that caused overfiltration. Um, you should revise a bleb when there's a hypotony um, that's unresponsive to observation. We'll try bandage contact lenses. Uh, we'll, uh, these things rarely work. I sometimes, I used to do autologous blood injections, uh, which causes some fibrosis. I stopped doing it because I didn't think it worked that well, and I also had a couple of patients in whom the blood tracked into the anterior chamber, and they just had a 50% a hyphema before I knew it, and that took a while to clear, and you, you just never want to do that. So I, I abandoned that approach, but some people still advocate for it. Um, and sometimes you will uh, actually uh, do transconjunctival flap suture placement. This is something that is sort of scary to watch. Um, and you have to be very comfortable uh, doing this. And she does it at the slit lamp. I do it either in the operating room or in a minor room under a microscope. 
I just prefer to have the patient with their head back so that they won't jerk suddenly. Uh, and with a speculum, I just think it's a more controlled situation. But um, you can actually do a single pass through the flap and essentially re-suture it the, the, and tie the, conjunctiva, tie the flap down and tighten it. Interestingly, the nylon will essentially migrate through the conjunctiva and you won't have much of a leak because if you're sh shutting down the fibrosis, shutting down the aqueous production or the aqueous leak, it'll have enough time to just melt through the conjunctiva and be under. It's really quite amazing. When I first saw this done and started doing it, I was just amazed um, that you could get away with this, but it does work without having to take the patient back for a major procedure in the operating room. So you get a patient phone call a day, two weeks or even eight weeks after the surgery, and they tell you that they bent over and they experience sudden excruciating pain in their eye uh, and they can't see anything out of the eye. What happened? Volunteers, anybody? What do you think happened to this patient? I've had this happen maybe in less than 10 patients over my 30 plus years of doing glaucoma surgery. In my experience, almost every one of them had been constipated and was straining on the toilet. And so I always ask people, they, they're, why is an eye doctor asking me about my bowel habits and whether I get constipated? It's because the Valsalva maneuver when you're trying to strain if you're constipated will raise the episcleral venous pressure the choroidal vessels will, will swell, and you can get a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. And this is diagnosed both clinically, if you can see it, um, but also with a B-scan ultrasound. Um, and the kissing choroidals, where there's so much choroidal that the retina is sticking to it, have a very poor prognosis, and those eyes are often lost. Um, some people advocate putting the patients on oral prednisone to prevent adhesions from forming across the, um, from one part of the retina to the other. I've never seen any evidence of this working. I've never seen it work, and I don't think there's any prospective or case series showing that that really makes a difference. Small suprachoroidal hemorrhages usually go away, but they can be very, very painful because blood under the retina is very, very painful. I've had patients, I've had a handful of intraoperative choroidal hemorrhages, uh, one of which I did during with a very overweight patient who, during routine cataract surgery who suddenly complained of pretty sharp pain um, and quite severe. I already, thankfully already had the lens in the eye, and so I quickly sutured the uh, wound and then looked and could see maybe a quadrant of suprachoroidal hemorrhage but the pressure was high. We pressurized the eye a little bit, put her on Diamox so the pressure wouldn't be that, that bad. It wasn't involving the macula, and she ended up with a 20-20 result. Obviously, that's the exception to the rule for bad suprachoroidal hemorrhages, but the point being that um, limited suprachoroidal hemorrhages are not the end of the world. You can sometimes get them, but if they wait three days before calling you, or to get seen, it's rarely a good thing. So let's talk about late postoperative complications. Uh, these include bleb dysesthesia, in other words, a painful bleb, um, bleb leaks that can happen late, uh, or late bleb failure. Um, a patient um, who has a functioning trabeculectomy and comes in complaining of an uncomfortable bleb and he notices that every time he blinks his eye, he hears a little click. And you're thinking, is this guy crazy? Why should it click every time I blink my eye? And I was looking for, I have a video that I took at the slit lamp with the slow motion thing on my iPhone, but I couldn't find it uh, in my library and I apologize. What's going on is that the bleb is so prominent that as they blink, they're capturing air under the, um, under the lid 
And then as they raise their eye again, the bubble pops. And so they have a click every time. And it hurts because it's a snap every time they open their eye. Treatment for that sometimes is just using artificial tear, different viscosity. Artificial tears can do that. Sometimes you can needle the bleb, but if the patient's really uncomfortable, you may need to take the trabeculectomy down and revise it, moving healthier conjunctiva into the area. You really don't want to see um, this. This is um, Dr. Leon Herndon at Duke, uh, who pri showed me this technique, which involves placing uh, what are called Palmberg sutures, invented by Paul Palmberg at Baskin Palmer. And I've done this a number of times, and it works quite well. You can do a uh, clear cornea suture, and then you do another one in the back. And I generally tie this down almost as a figure of eight. The idea is that it presses down on the bleb and causes fibrosis. And it's the same sort of thing that you get. Um, it'll migrate through, but it causes enough fibrosis that it just changes the architecture of the bleb enough that the lid is not capturing air or being really uncomfortable. So you can see that when you pull down on this, it just squashes the bleb down, even though there's still a filtration. So just that, that line there will probably uh, be enough to change the architecture of the bleb. It's a very useful technique. This is the same video, I think, so let's skip back. So this is one of my cases. This is a patient who had a trabeculectomy uh, years past, hadn't seen him for a long time, and calls in, as you can read, to complain of gradually decreasing vision in his right eye, and his family is telling him that his eye looks weird. Okay? And he has no pain or foreign body sensation. And the slit lamp exam reveals this. OK, so what is this? What's the differential diagnosis here? Obviously, you need to be thinking about a malignancy. OK, could this be a squamous cell? Um, you know, could it be some bad malignancy of the conjunctiva? But that goes down on the list when the patient has a history of a trabeculectomy, and the base is where the trabeculectomy um, is. And these, I, I was amazed. When I was a fellow, I had a patient like this, and my mentor, Dr. Spath, said, oh, just cut it off. And I was thinking, oh, my God, just cut it off? And I had this concept that a bleb is like a bubble, but it's actually not. A bleb is like a sponge that's covered with epithelium. And what's happening in situations like this is that the bleb with lid motion is constantly squishing the bleb forward. And at some point, the epithelium grows up onto it. And with each movement of the bleb, it dissects into the subepithelial space until it's sitting on Bowman's membrane and the conjunctiva is, um, or the epithelium is riding up over the bleb. So here's, you'll understand the anatomy when sure. I show you this. Uh, video. Yeah. We'll take a look. It is. So all you really need to do oh, is I just watch. have the audio. Mm -hmm. I can turn this down. I think I took it with my iPhone and. Uh, I was talking to my fellow or resident when I was doing this. So I'm just using an iris spatula. And here you can see I'm going under the thing. And boop, I just pop out. And so you can see that it's this whole little flap that's sitting uh, on the epithelium. I did one of these recently. It may have been with, my, with Michael. I don't think I did one with you. Um, but you can see that 
you can peel the whole thing off. I should speed up this video, but this is real time. I just did this in the minor room. I'll speed it up here a little bit. And you just cut it off. Okay, the bleb isn't leaking. And here's what he looked like a few days later. So it's really quite amazing that you can do this. Um, and I don't, oh yeah, this is the same. This is the same patient just with a slit lamp view. And you can see he has a nice bleb. It's still working and he'll do fine. It may recur, but now that he knows what it is, he knows we can fix it if it happens, but I don't want to mess with a bleb that's working, okay? So to summarize, you know, early identification, you really need to see these trabeculectomy patients um, early and frequently, and your goal is to identify things that can cause a bleb to fail. You should not pat your back, pat yourself on the back, if a trabeculectomy is working great at one day or one week, the battle is not over. You need to continue to monitor them. Um, and you need careful observation skills if you are going to become a blebologist. And, um, but you need to be very specific in what you're treating uh, with the, um, uh, when the bleb is failing. And you need to also instruct the patient that they really need to have their blebs monitored lifetime. They're at lifetime risk of infection, that getting a sudden red eye in an eye that had a trabeculectomy really needs to be seen by an ophthalmologist relatively quickly, like in a day or two, if not sooner, um, because you want to intervene if they have an early bleb infection because you can prevent that from progressing to endophthalmitis and losing the eye. So again, our ultimate goal is a functional bleb, um, a comfortable long-term filtration bleb, and retaining the visual function of our patients. So as I said earlier, you know, we just started there, the basic techniques, but those patients have a two to four month period ahead of them of careful monitoring to make sure that what we did today sets them on the right uh, trajectory and right path. So with that, I'll stop, and if you have any other questions or whatever, uh, put up your hand, I'll hand you the microphone, and you can ask any questions. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I want to find out the grading. If a patient has blebitis, how do you grade the, the blebitis, and how do you manage endophthalmitis post trabeculectomy? Well, if they have true endophthalmitis, I send it to my vitreo retinal colleagues, and they'll do intravitreal injections of fortified antibiotics, and they'll treat them even with a vitrectomy if there is purulence in the vitreous cavity. I mean, at that point, you're not worried about having the bleb survive. You're trying to prevent them from going blind. And so if you have to sacrifice the bleb, and they have to take the conjunctiva down to do a... Um, you know, vitrectomy or whatever, you know, we'll give up on the trabeculectomy and, and save the eye. The issue uh, there, I guess there is some sort of grading scheme for blebitis. I don't usually grade it, but if there's just um, a little purulence in the bleb, um, I will treat that aggressively with, um, if there's purulence in the bleb or whiteness in the bleb, but the anterior chamber has no cell, I will treat that aggressively with a broad spectrum fluoroquinolone like uh, moxifloxacin. And I'll even have them do it every hour or so and see them, you know, 18 hours later, 24 hours later. It's not somebody you see on a Friday afternoon and say, see you on Monday, because they can get better or they can progress to endophthalmitis. And you really need to see them every day until you're confident that you fix the problem. 
Um, if there's anterior chamber reaction, we'll sometimes do some subconjunctival injection of fortified antibiotics. But sometimes if they're a trustworthy patient, I will still um, use very frequent fortified, um, or very frequent uh, fluoroquinolones and just watch them and maybe depending on when they come in and you finally see them in the afternoon, I may see them the next morning to just make sure that it's not progressing. Um, if they have a hypopion, uh, then, you know, they're really at risk for developing um, endophthalmitis, and I get my vitreoretinal colleagues involved and will often do, and do a B-scan. If you can't see the back of the eye, you need to do a B-scan to make sure that they don't have vitreous involvement. If you can dilate them and see perfectly well into the back of the eye, you can be reasonably confident that they don't have a vitritis yet but ultrasound can give you some in, uh, indication. We'll often do a B-scan ultrasound every day uh, on these patients to just monitor them until we're confident that they're doing well. The other thing that you do at the beginning when they present with a um, possible bleb infection is we will uh, look for a bleb leak um, because if there's a big leak, um, you need to sterilize it but it's gonna come back if you don't fix the leak. And usually what that requires is to excise the previous bleb, undermine the healthy conjunctiva more posteriorly, and pull it all forward to bring healthy conjunctiva over the trabeculectomy. Much of the time, you'll get that to work. You'll often give the patient some ptosis because you're pulling down, so pulling the conjunctiva down, and I'll warn them that they will almost certainly have a ptosis after I do that procedure. They'll also be pretty uncomfortable because I often have to use a lot of sutures to prevent it from pulling back. Um, but it usually gets more comfortable for the patients once the vicral sutures start to soften. And, um, and they'll often have a lot of astigmatism because I'm cinching it down to the limbus and tying things tight to pull everything down. So I tell them their vision's going to be terrible uh, for a few weeks to a few months until everything settles down, but we've got to protect the eye from getting an infection. Does that, that answer your question? Yeah. How common is wipeout syndrome, and what's been your experience, if you've had any? I think... In my experience, I've been doing TRABS for 35 years now. I don't know that I've, I'm, I'm not convinced I've ever even seen it. Um, so I think it's very rare. Um, I think the cause of it, yes, you worry about patients who have, you know, advanced glaucoma splitting fixation. And in those patients, you want to do an aggressive trabeculectomy knowing that you'll tolerate a little bit of early hypotony rather than having early high pressures. You know, if you know that the patient has a 0.99 cup and end-stage visual fields, you're not going to tolerate a pressure of 28 on the first postoperative day. You're going to treat that aggressively. But if you treat every trabeculectomy the same, um, you're going to get wipe out if you're not being aggressive about monitoring early high pressures uh, in a patient who has advanced disease. 